This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so Professor Aberbach will resume his talks on Brion's con Skoda theorem. All right, well, thank you very much, Professor Trevedi. Um, hello, everybody. I said good morning earlier, but uh, I think I'm one of the few people for whom it's morning. All right, so uh, last time we uh, discussed the uh, Branson Skoda theorem in character. From holds up to tight closure. Um, and we ended the um, talk by noting that this reduction J, if it's L generated, then a key uh, observation was that J to the LQ is contained in the Qth bracket power. And then we said, well, what about the kind of remaining powers of J? Can we get any more information? So um, let's suppose that we don't have the tight closure here so that we're in say a regular ring. Then if we, if we look at I to the L uh, integral closure, that's contained in J and say that's generated by A1 through AL. So, then an element X in I to the L bar implies that uh, X is equal to R1 A1 plus R2 A2 plus uh, R L A L. And the question then becomes, what can we say about the R's? So what can we say about R1 through RL. So for instance, can we uh, say something really nice like uh, is are the Rs in I to the L minus one? Well, that's, that's probably unlikely, uh, but it turns out we can make some statements and one has to be careful. It's difficult to do the computations here because of course the, um, any, any information you get is up to say Kazool uh, relations on the Rs with respect to the A's. So it's, it's not necessarily that easy a computation. So that's the, the beginning of uh, today's lecture uh, is to talk about Brianson Skoda theorems uh, with coefficients. In other words, we're looking to say, ask, you know, to get some information on those R's. So let me start with some, uh, a def couple of definitions. Uh, if I is contained in R, and here I just want to assume that we're in a no theory and ring, then let's let I unmixed be the intersection of the minimal component of the ideal I. So this just removes the embedded components, okay? And the second definition we need is something related to the height, what we call the big height of I. And so, this is equal to the maximum of the height of P such that P is a minimal prime of I. Right. So this is exactly the height if this ideal has uh, minimal primes of all of the same height, but in general, we can have heights, different heights, and so the big height might be strictly larger than the height. Okay, so here is the first theorem. Uh, I'm using, again, I'm using the note, the numbering from the, the write-up. Uh, so this was proved in 1993 by myself and Craig Hunicke, and what it says is the following. Let's let our M be a regular local ring uh, that 
contains a field. Containing a field. Um, say we have I is an ideal of R. Uh, let's let L equal the analytic spread of I. And let's let H be the big height. I've usually used H for the height, but here it is the big height. Um, so, and J contained in I a reduction. So then for all W greater than or equal to zero, if we look at I to the <laughs> L plus W integral closure, this is contained in J to the W plus one, Okay, we're in a regular ring, so that, that by itself is the brienson skoda theorem. But what we can say then is that this is in J to the L minus H unmixed. So in other words, the, we can take the R's on the left-hand page to be in this ideal that is related to I itself. Okay. And we were interested in this in part because it, uh, uh, Hunicke, um, that he had proved uh, about uh, the connection between Cohen Macaulay <laughs> associated graded rings and, uh, um, and, and uh, Reese rings. Uh, over Cone McCall rings. I think maybe there's some people who could mute who that might be helpful. Um, so I want to uh, do the proof of this, but let me make some observations. Uh, and so, what are my observations? I'm already forgetting. Um, oh, Okay, so uh, in, uh, in this setting, so if, if we have J contained in I a reduction, then the minimal primes, these two, are, these two ideals are the same up to radical. So the minimum of ideals primes of J are the same as the minimum primes of I. And so we have that the big heights are the same. So that's one thing we'll need. And the second is that in a regular local ring, well, in a regular ring of characteristic P, uh, for any ideal, A contained in R, the associated primes of R mod A to the bracket Q are, these are equal to the associated primes of R mod A. That again, that's the flatness of Frobenius. Okay, so uh, most of the work is in the following lemma. Let's prove this lemma. So we're really working on this theorem. So let's let R, I, J, L, maybe H should show up here too, as in the statement of the theorem. And what does our lemma say? It says, yeah, let's throw in H. Uh, it says exists an F not equal to zero, such that for all Q sufficiently large, if we multiply J to the L minus one Q by F, then we are in 
the following ideal, j to the L minus h unmixed, all taken to the qth bracket power. Okay, so what this is saying here is, if you look back at our question uh, over here, this extra information that we have, we'd like to get something from it. And so this is saying there's a uniform multiplier F that takes that quantity and puts it in a Qth bracket power. And sure enough, right, it's the Qth bracket power of the coefficients. And so that's how we're going to uh, prove our theorem. Okay, so, um, so let's look at the proof of this. Uh, all right, so let's, um, let's let P be a minimal prime of J, which is also a minimal prime of I. Uh, so, uh, Then if we localize, so J localized at P, this has a minimal reduction um, that is generated by the, the analytic spread of JRP, okay, uh, but that's, less than or equal to the dimension of RP. And that is less than or equal to the big height because we took a minimal prime of J here. So, uh, okay, so let uh, L sub, sub P be such a minimal reduction. And, uh, Right, and of course, the number of generators of L sub P is less. Okay, uh, so we can choose, I'm gonna call it F sub P. This is not a localization now, this is an index to P. Uh, as in exercise two, and that's uh, for uh, this LP contained in JRP, okay? And without loss of generality, we can assume that FP is actually an R, we can clear denominators, okay? Uh, so, then what do we get? Um, so we do the computation um, as in the proof of uh, theorem 1.8, okay? And now using the work that you guys are gonna do, so in exercise three, here is the what the computation gives us. We have that, F sub P times JRP to the L minus one Q. Where does that sit? Well, you see the L in, when we localize the analytic spread is dropped. So what's what the now L has become a W that's bigger than or bigger than zero in fact. Okay, so this is contained in, we're putting things in a power of the reduction. And so where, what power do we get? Well, once we finish the computation, we're in a Qth bracket power, but the power is we've got L minus one uh, minus H plus one. And we're taking that whole thing to the qth power. So again, this is 
just to right this is this is a w in the in the argument and then this is we're subtracting off uh something that's at least as big as the analytic spread and then a, the plus one okay and so where is this well now we can make our uh so this is once we simplify I guess it's we're just doing a simplification. This is LP to the L minus H to the bracket Q. And of course, that's contained in JRP to the L minus H to the bracket Q. Right. So The thing is now that we apply observation two, so by observation two and take the product of all the FPs, uh, to get our result. Okay, so uh, perhaps I haven't been as clear as I could be, but I'll let you think about it or go back to the notes where it's maybe written up a little bit more uh, clearly. And so this is the key to the whole thing. So I think um, ah, I gave myself an extra page, meaning I was going to say more. Uh, so now we can go to the proof of the actual theorem. And again, I'll do the W equals zero case. So uh, let's prove that I to the L integral closure is contained in J times I to the L minus H quantity unmixed. So we, again, remember when we, when we take powers of an ideal, even if we started with an ideal without any embedded primes, we're likely to get embedded primes. So we, we have to remove them in, in this argument uh, or in this theorem. Okay, so uh, let's let J contained in I B our minimal reduction. I guess that's actually stated in the theorem. Um, and what do we want to do? Uh, take C uh, not equal to zero as in exercise two. And that's for the ideal I to the L. Our F not equal to zero as in the lemma. And uh, so we start with some X in I to the L bar in the integral closure. And then for all Q sufficiently large, uh, we have the following. We look at C times F X to the Q. And so where is that? Well, using the C, that's in J to the LQ, which is now contained in J to the bracket Q, J to the L minus one Q, uh, times, let's put back that F times there, okay? And now by the lemma, This is contained in J to the Q bracket Q times J to the L minus H unmixed to the bracket Q. And bracket Qs are nice in the sense of multiplication. So that's J times J L minus H unmixed 
all to the Q. And that's exactly the criteria for being in tight closure. So X is in J times J to the L minus H unmixed tight closure. And that is equal to J times J L minus H unmixed because we're in a regular local ring. And so all ideals are tightly close. Uh, and one of the, the early uh, kind of revelations to me was the idea that, uh, you know, in a regular ring or in weekly F regular rings in general, ideals are tightly closed. And so you might think, well, you can't really use tight closure to, prove theorems in, in such a ring all that easily, but it turns out that using the tight closure is incredibly powerful, even in rings, or especially in rings where every ideal is tightly closed. So I did include in the notes a um, some information about how we use this associated graded rings uh, and cohen macauliness but I uh, decided that in this talk, I wouldn't be able to squeeze that all in. So I'll refer you to the notes for that. Okay. Um, and so I want to turn my attention to F rational rings and go back to trying to understand the uh, the Brands and Skoda theorem in F rational rings, and if you remember, uh, even in the regular case, sorry, not in the regular, even in the pseudo rational case or rational singularities case, the full Brands and Skoda theorem was was not known, and uh, so let's uh, talk about that. And so we want to switch our attention now to the case of F rational rings. All right, so as I said, this result of Lippmann and Tessier is uh, only partial. There it wasn't quite the full Briance and Skoda theorem. So that leaves the question, is this full Briance and Skoda theorem true? And the answer, at least to some extent, uh, is yes. Uh, so Punicki and I were able to prove the following theorem in 2001. And so let me state the theorem. Uh, let's let Rm be and F rational uh, local ring. And in this case, by F rational, that means it's characteristic P. Um, suppose I contained in R is, um, has, is an ideal. J contained in I is a reduction and say L equals the analytic spread of I. Uh, then as usual for all W greater than or equal to zero, we do get the full Briance and Skoda theorem. I to the L plus W bar, the integral closure is contained in J to the W plus one. That then in characteristic zero, this gives um, the same result for, uh, for Algebras 
of finite type uh, over, whoops, finite type over a field of characteristic zero. having rational singularities. So again, that's that's a reduction to characteristic P result, which I'm not gonna discuss uh, in these lectures. So I want to <clears throat> try to go over the proof of this. It's, there's some technical uh, information that we'll have to deal with. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll get to that in a minute. So remember that F rational says that um, parameter ideals are tightly closed. Okay, we, uh, since we're only dealing, we're only going to deal here with uh, local rings, uh, it's a little nicer. So it's basically kind of any, any ideal generated by part of a system of parameters is probably the best way to think about that. Um, so, but not all ideals, okay. And so the thing is that if the analytic spread of I is strictly bigger than the height of I and J is a minimal reduction, uh, then J is not contained in a parameter ideal. Okay, so there's there's you can't get at this directly. Uh, that's that's the problem. So here is the idea. So given our J contained in I, that's a reduction, find um, find a uh, parameter ideal uh, I'll call B sub N such that, well, you can't get J to be inside B sub N, but you can get them to be emmatically close so that J is congruent to B N, at least once we mod out the maximal ideal to the nth power, okay? And then, then, if R is F rational, that implies B sub N is tightly closed, all right? And now let N go to infinity and use the Kroll intersection theorem to conclude uh, that uh, we get our result. I'll say, I, I guess I'll, I'll say that again as when we do the proof. Okay, uh, so in order to do this, we'll need two technical results. They're both rather long. And so what I've done is I, I've already written them out because I figured I would just uh, mess up writing them. But let me try to go over them uh, 
and tell you what's going on. Um, I'm going to suggest for those of you, if you're taking notes, you may not want you may want to not try to write all of this down, uh, but it is all in the the notes that are online. So let me start with lemma 2.8. Okay, so suppose we have our local ring, and I will be assuming here that we have infinite residue field, and as usual, we have our uh, minimal reduction J contained in I, and L is the analytic spread. So it turns out that the key is to pick a very nice generating set for the ideal J. And so what qualities does that have? Uh, that's these one, two, and three, which I'll go over. So suppose, whoops. So it turns out there exists a generating set, A1 through AL for J. And in the next few um, arguments, let me use J sub I to mean the partial ideal generated by A1 up to AI. Okay, so the properties that this has is, suppose we take a prime containing I, Okay, and that prime has height up to the analytic spread. Okay, so we've got this height H ideal, the analytic spread is larger, and um, we've got a prime kind of somewhere in that range containing I. Then uh, then J sub I, whoop. Let's, even though I wrote it ahead of time, I still manage to mess up. So suppose I is the height of that prime. Uh, so then if we take the first I elements, we do get a reduction of the ideal lo locally at that prime. Okay, now it's not necessarily minimal, but it is a reduction. Okay, so, uh, that turns out to be very powerful. Um, all right, so second, for if we take n large enough, if we look at the following ideal, we look at j sub i, i to the n colon i to the n plus one. So we look at that ideal, and then we also add i. Then the height of that is at least i plus one. So that says, that there's no primes too small containing both I and this colon ideal, okay? And notice this is very much related to thinking about reduction numbers. That colon is related to reduction numbers. Um, and the third property is that if we take the AIs and we change them by elements of the square of the ideal, so to get CIs, then both of these properties still hold. Okay, so once we've got this nice generating set, you can use elements of I squared to modify them at no cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is the um, lemma 2.8. Let me move that up. And then proposition 2.9, right? So we need a little bit more information on R. So suppose our local ring R is equidimensional and catenary. Uh, and really just, I think, complete domain. That's as nice as we can get. And again, with infinite residue field. So suppose again, we have J as our minimal reduction of an height H ideal, analytic spread L. Suppose we've written J as in lemma 2.8, but I'll use primes on to start with, all right? So this is a little bit more technical. So let's fix an N greater than zero. That N is like in our BN where I'm gonna to wanna to think about M to the N and a W that comes from the Briands and Skoda theorem. So we can change the A primes to, to, to A, to A's and J. So 
again, just modifying by elements of I squared, that's the first condition. We can also pick T's, so TH plus one through TL in the maximal ideal. And for the lower ones, TH through T1, I'm just gonna set those equal to zero. So then those TIs we can pick in M to the N, all right? So we're gonna do this for a sequence of Ns going to infinity. Then if we take the A's and we add the T's, so B, we get V1 through V1, VL, these will be part of a system of parameters. So if we take the ideal of B's and we're in an F rational ring, that ideal will be tightly closed. Uh, I don't know that we're gonna use it very much in our argument, but these T's are actually part of a system of parameters in R mod I. And then uh, the last one, that is a little hard to, to gauge what it really means, but we will use this, is that we, for, for some M, some exponent large enough, in the range of I's between H and L minus one, what happens to T I plus one? So this is, in other words, this is T H plus one through T L. It is in this nice colon, that multiplies high powers of i back into powers of j sub i. So notice, in other words, so here we are um, reducing the index here, right? From i plus one to i, all right? And this happens in a certain range that, that we need, okay? So again, I'm reminding you, j sub i is the, ideal generated by the, the first I elements. So I'm going to, so now what I wanna do is I wanna go through the argument in the simplest case, which is when L is H plus one and show you how this works. So let's keep 2.9 available. So let's do the proof of theorem 2.6 when L is H plus one and W is equal to zero. Okay, let me catch up on my notes to where I am. Okay. All right, so first off, let's fix fix n bigger than zero, and let's, um, let's choose uh, j equals a1 through ah, ah plus one, all right? And th plus one in m to the n as in, Proposition 2.9. Okay. So uh, I think I'm running maybe a little bit. Well, I think I have time. Um, okay, so I won't condense, try to condense the argument too much. Uh, so uh, then. Uh, Let's make the following observation. Well, let's let's also choose M large enough uh, such that we have um, TH plus one I to the M plus K. Uh, this is bad notation. My, my little K here is an index. It's not the residue field. Uh, so, but. Um, so where is this? This is in J H to the K I to the M. Okay. Uh, so remember J H is just the uh, first H of the A's. 
All right. So then uh, we can check. I'll let you guys do the work that for all, let me call it n prime greater than zero, t h plus one to the n prime i to the m plus k n prime. Well, we just repeatedly uh, use the inclusion above. Just keep using this over and over again. And where does that land? That lands in j h to the k n prime i to the m. Okay, so that's the key observation. All right, so now let's pick uh, x in i to the l bar and c as in exercise two. Okay, and C prime in I to the M not in R naught. Uh, in this case, in our F rational ring, R naught is just everything but zero. Uh, sorry, not minus R naught. Um, that should be, let me just say, the. Uh, this just needs to not be zero. It needs to be in R naught. Sorry, not, not out of R. Okay, so now we want to compute. Uh, so, so what do we get? We get that, let's look at C times C prime X to the Q. Okay, so where is this? Well, we're not going to use the C prime yet. C times X to the Q is in J to the Q L. All right, and so where is this? Um, so this is in oops, C prime uh, J to the bracket Q times J to the L minus one. Q. All right. So let's say um, that the C C prime X to the Q is equal to, we still got the C prime, we've got R1 A1 to the Q plus R H a h to the q plus r h plus one, a h plus one to the q. And these, the r's, the r sub i's are in j to the l minus one q. That's what we have. Okay. All right. So, um, let's think about what happens when we multiply uh, this last coefficient. We, we, we really only care about that coefficient. So this coefficient, we can multiply by th plus one. So, um, so then let's look at t, h plus one to the Q times C prime uh, R H plus one. That's what we want to look at. And where does that land? Well, this is in T H plus one, the C prime R H plus one is in I to the H Q plus M. 
That's where the C, the C prime gets us that plus M. Uh, and that is contained in J sub H to the HQ uh, over here by that observation, All right? But this ideal is H generated and we've got the HQ power. And so this is contained in JH to the bracket Q, All right? So what we're gonna do is in the sum above, oops, in this sum, we're gonna add and subtract that value. So that's, that's adding zero. And we're gonna use the fact that when we, um, that the result lives back in the earlier part. Right. So, um, so add and subtract uh, T H plus one Q C prime R H plus one. Okay, to get that C C prime X to the Q is in, I, I'm a little short on time. So, um, so we're gonna get in A1 to the Q, A H to the Q plus, well, we've added and subtracted. So we have a coefficient of A H plus one Q and a coefficient of T H plus one Q. So this is going to be in that, I this ideal plus the ideal generated by a h plus one to the q plus t h plus one to the q. And so this is a one through a h b h plus one to the q. All right, and this guy is a parameter ideal. And so what we've now shown is that we have I to the L plus one bar is contained in A1 through AH B H plus one star, which is equal to the ideal A1 through AH, oops. H plus one, because we're in an F rational ring. And so, um, so now we let N go to infinity and we've got I to the L bar is um, contained in J plus m to the n, so maybe over here, sorry, uh, this is contained in j plus m to the n uh, for all n. And so what we get is that i to the l bar is contained in j by the Krull intersection. And that's, that's the proof. So uh, looks like I'm out of time. So uh, let, me, let me take one more minute, if I may, just to say the, what is the general strategy? Um, you know, what if, what if the analytic spread were H plus two? Uh, what we'd have is um, in this sum on the, over here in this sum, there'd be one more piece of the sum, right? And we'd also have a second T. And so we just work backwards. We'd start with TH plus two and we would multiply by the Qth power of it. 
and that would push, um, we would be able to push uh, back into the first H plus one things with some information about the coefficients on A H plus one that's good enough to then multiply by T H plus one and push stuff back into here. And that's the general argument. It works uh, nicely, but it's it's a little technical. Uh, so, so there you have the Brianson Skoda theorem now in F rational links and it's full beauty. Uh, I don't know in mixed characteristic that anybody has actually proved this. I'm I'm not sure about that. No, thank you. So are there any questions or comments?